Hi, welcome back. I'm glad you're joining me again where I hope you listened to the first part. We're continuing the lesson about what your inheritance is. And it's so very important, like I said in the, the first part, that we know what our inheritance is because that is where everything else springs from. Is when we know what our inheritance is, then everything else will just fall into place. Everything will be in the right priority and we won't be getting off track seeking after other things and getting distracted and we'll missing our keep you know moving our focus off of him onto other things. Of course we don't want to do that and that's why Paul prayed like I mentioned last time in Ephesians 1 verse 18 that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints so he wants this is scripture I mean this is Paul praying a critical prayer for all the church back then here now in the future I mean, this is what God wants us to know, is that we would come to the revelation of what his inheritance is. So it's definitely worthy to know what is your inheritance, right? We should at least hear one lesson on it, right? So as I was talking, in the, we really got, we just hit the nail on the head and basically, in a nutshell, your inheritance is God. I know that's definitely not complicated, is it? But, you know, the gospel's not meant to be complicated. It's not meant to be, you know, a long, winding, dark, and confusing, mysterious road to revelation. It's meant to be bright and clear and straight, simple. And the answer is Jesus. So as it says in Romans 8, verse 16 and 17, the Spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit's there to witness to you and assure you that you will always be a child of God. As you have trusted in Christ, he's there to assure you of that. In verse 17, and if we are his children then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. Only we must share his suffering if we are to share his glory. And what that part's talking about is you have to acknowledge the fact that your old man was crucified with Christ. You suffer there on the cross in Christ also and now you're a new creation and the life that you now live is by the Spirit through Christ Christ himself living his life through you amen that's your quote-unquote suffering okay so you can at the same time and be enjoying all his glory you know when you realize that now the life that you live is Christ in you the hope of glory Amen. And as it clearly says right there, God, you have inherited God. You are a joint heir with Jesus. And is there anything that Jesus doesn't have? Nope. That's pretty much the, the point blank answer, right? There's nothing Jesus is missing. So when you inherit Jesus, when you are a joint heir with Jesus, you're not missing anything. Amen? So it's, it's just good to come to this assurance that in Christ, He doesn't call us to be lacking in any good thing. You know, I mean, as it says in 2 Peter 1 verse 3, that, that He has blessed us with all things that pertain to life, and godliness through Jesus Christ. You know, we are blessed and 
totally saturated with God himself. You are complete in him. And in the flesh, you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily in Christ, as it says in Colossians 2, 9. You know, when you are full of him, what, you know, full means full. When you're full of him, and the key is becoming aware of this fullness that you have in him. When you're aware, man, I am jam-packed with God. <laughs> I just, I am not missing anything. He and I are one, and he's not withholding any good thing from me. And, and just knowing his goodness, his overwhelming generosity towards you in Christ is what just establishes your heart to be able to walk in the wonderful life that he's called you to. And that's where we were talking about last time, where we left off, is you have received his righteousness as a gift. It's of him, as we said in Isaiah 54, 17. Let me read it again. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. So, your righteousness is not your own personal righteousness. It's an inheritance. It's a gift that he's given you. It's, that's a wonderful, wonderful inheritance that we've been given through Jesus Christ as our eternal right standing before God by his work alone not by our own personal works which really takes a load off doesn't it it really loosens your load lightens your load I guess I should say you know you aren't called to work up and sweat and you know make yourself act properly by your own strength no, we're, we're called to come to the knowledge of Him by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And in that understanding, then just the fruit of the Spirit manifests in your life effortlessly. Because now it's Him bearing good fruit by the, fruit, by the Holy Spirit. Not by you, but by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, knowing that our righteousness is a gift, and actually it says it here in Romans 5, 17 also, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, talking about Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So we see right there, that that is again our inheritance is the gift of righteousness and and righteousness is closely tied to walking in this gift of eternal life you know it's by grace that you are walking and enjoying his life and you know I guess I should mention here some people think eternal life is up in heaven you know, when we get to heaven, they think it's a physical place. But actually, as it says in John 17, 3, Jesus explained that eternal life, in a nutshell, is knowing the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, right? It's having an intimate knowledge of our Heavenly Father. You know, walking in fellowship, in friendship, and and us understanding him correctly and knowing how much he knows us also you know he's not a distant god but he's a close heavenly father who cares about everything that concerns you and just knowing truths like this is what causes you to draw near to him in your heart it's never that you've fall away or become distant physically speaking or even spiritually speaking from him 
but the awareness of your close proximity proximity to him becomes uh, dim if you don't understand what you've been given in Christ. So as we know him and know the closeness, the presence that we walk in with him, you know, his, his undivided attention and companionship all the time. He said, I'll never leave you. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And just knowing these good things that we have in Christ, these promises, understanding and knowing them, is what causes us to become aware that we are close to Him. <laughs> that we haven't been ever separated from Him when we're in Christ. And knowing that is in fact enabling you to walk closely and know Him intimately, right? It's through the knowledge of Him that you walk closely with Him. And so, as we're saying here, this is what life is, and this is how you reign or how you abound with this eternal life, which again is not up in heaven somewhere, but it's here on earth, knowing Him intimately. And we abound in that intimate fellowship, that life that we have with Him through receiving this gift of righteousness. So that's your inheritance, is this abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And just knowing and receiving these things as gifts will enable you to reign in life. So knowing this inheritance is crucial to abounding and walking in the very thing that Jesus came to give you abundantly. You know, Jesus came, he said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, John 10.10. 10. Right? So if we don't even first begin to understand that it's by a gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace that we receive, and grace, of course, is His unmerited, wonderful, over-abundant favor. You, you are His favorite, you could say in a nutshell. That's an easy way to put and to explain grace, is you are His favorite. And when you receive that, you're receiving grace, because that's literally what grace means, is a abundant, unconditional favors from the Lord. Amen? So when you receive grace and the gift of righteousness, well then you're, you are walking in His eternal life and you are abounding in it. Amen? And that's what He came to give us. Praise God. And it even mentions it there again in Romans 5.21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness unto, or to, in King James, but it's really unto, for the purpose of, to get to the point of, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we want grace to reign in order to get to the point where we're enjoying eternal life. And that only comes through righteousness by receiving the gift of righteousness. See how all they're intertwined? You know, they all connect, all these spiritual points and uh, the, the fullness of what we've been given in Christ. They're, of course, not disjointed, boxy things, but they all work together. And for us to understand that grace really reigns, I mean, even grace reigns through receiving that righteousness, like it just says there in that verse. If you don't realize your first righteous and right standing with God through Jesus Christ, 
you are blocking grace from reigning in your life, from, from having an effect in your life. You know, it says in Galatians that when you walk by the law, when you, in, in a sense, when you are resisting the gift of righteousness, but you're trying to attain righteousness by your own works, by the works of the law, it says you've fallen from grace. So we have to first receive the gift of righteousness, and of course, understanding the gift of righteousness is comes by grace also. <laughs> So they're all connected, but the point is, is we want to reign and abund, abound in his life, right? None of us wants to walk in the, the death and the corruption that's in the world. That's a miserable, miserable place to live in your own heart. It's a dismal place that is lacking hope and the spark of life. It's a dull and dreary way of living, right? So let's focus on the right message. And that's, I'm glad that's why you're here today, where we can know that this is your inheritance, is the gift of righteousness. And thereby you can reign in this abundant life that he came to give you, right? Amen. So again, another thing that we've been given in, as our inheritance is being in the kingdom of God. As Jesus said in Matthew 25, 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Oh, wow. This has been set aside for you since the beginning of time. God has had this in store, laid up for you, a treasure for you to possess, this kingdom of God. So that's your inheritance. And people, you know, it does sound kind of abstract, doesn't it? Kingdom of God. Well, you know, we do walk by faith and not by sight. So, of course, things of the Spirit aren't something you can just kind of go and put your finger on, right? So to, I have a teaching on the kingdom of God, but in a nutshell, a big part, a big part of the kingdom of God is the fact that, as it says in Romans 4, 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. So when you are enjoying and receiving this gift of righteousness and letting the, the knowledge of the fact that God has peace towards you, he's no longer angry towards you, the war between you and him is over. There's only peace and goodwill, as it says in Luke 2.14, towards you. Favors, favors. I mean, you don't give your enemies favors, right? Well, God does. <laughs> you know, that's the, I mean, he has supernatural peace. He even gives his enemies favors. That's the goodness of the gospel. So when you let this peace and righteousness and joy, the joy that God has over you, like I said in the first lesson, that he is exuberantly, overwhelmingly happy that you are his. You're his child. And that just gives him great joy. And knowing the joy of the Lord that he has over you and for you gives you joy. It gives you joy to know, man, I have a heavenly father who's overwhelmingly happy with me. He's content with me. I have his righteousness. I'm always in right standing with him. We're, we're at peace. We're good friends. You know, when you know these things in your heart, you are beginning and, and enjoying walking in the kingdom of God. This is, this is where the kingdom of God resides, is in those things. 
is experiencing those things in your heart, right there in your own heart. So it's not out there somewhere or, you know, maybe in the future you'll arrive there. Well, you know, when we get to heaven, of course, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God will be right there too. <laughs> but we can enjoy the kingdom of God right now in our own hearts, just as it says there in Romans. Amen? Amen. So another promise talking about being in the kingdom of God in Colossians 1 verse 12 it says and, and you know Paul is praying a prayer here and he says giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light you know this is he, he wants you to know you are qualified to share what Jesus has paid a dear price for. You have an inheritance. You aren't broke, busted, and disgusted. You know, let's come to the awareness of the abundance, the overwhelming goodness that we've been provided in Christ. You know, he, you, you are qualified by Him, not in and of yourself. He has qualified you to share in this inheritance as Paul says here, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this is an, another awesome inheritance that we've been given is the fact that we've been redeemed and redemption as it says right there defined right there in verse 14 Colossians 1 14 is the forgiveness of sins period and it doesn't say according to your good confessions or according to your good works you are forgiven no it's through him he has qualified you to share in that inheritance you are forgiven forever forever this the slate has been wiped clean and you are pure and spotless, holy forever through the blood of Jesus Christ alone. Amen. You are set free from past mistakes and uh, a guilty conscience because that's the power of the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for you. It has, it has the ability as you receive this truth to purge your conscience from the awareness of sins. Amen. That's amazing, amazing power of the gospel is to know that you are perfect in Him as it says in Hebrews 10 verse 14. So also as it says right there, you are no longer, and we're here talking about the kingdom of God, you've inherited the kingdom, not of the devil, of God. You've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. You you are, you know, you don't have one foot in the other kingdom and one foot in this kingdom, as some Christians may think. You know, they think, well, am I going to act good today and the devil will reign or I'm in, you know, no. I mean, you are literally always in the kingdom of light. The kingdom of his son, delivered out of the power of darkness. Now sometimes, just to clarify and explain, some Christians act like the devil. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that their position in the spirit realm has changed. And this is what you call understanding your spiritual identity. And I have a teaching on that. So if you need understanding that, please go and listen to that series. It will really benefit you because it will greatly benefit you. Because once you start understanding that you are a spirit, and in the spirit realm, you and Jesus are indivisible. You are one, as it says in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, with Jesus. After trusting in Him, there's no separation or division between you two, you and Him. You're one spirit. And so, is Jesus ever in the kingdom of darkness? No. So neither are you. 
Now, as I was saying, Christians who do act, you know, their, their, their behavior is not really all too great. Well, it's because they, in the soul realm, they don't understand the gospel truths like I've been sharing here. And this is why it's so good to understand the truth. You know, Jesus said the truth that you know will set you free. So it's so good to know the truth and not walk around like a uninformed Christian like so many are. You know, there's many Christians out there who don't let their understanding be transformed or renewed according to the Word of God. And so they walk around with an unrenewed mind or soul. And as it says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you think confused thoughts, don't realizing, not realizing who you are in Christ, well then that's how you will act out your life too. So that explains why even though you are always, 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 always in the kingdom of light, spiritually speaking, you can still act crazy. <laughs> I'm not saying you personally, but we can see some Christians acting crazy because they don't have their minds renewed to the truth. And that's the benefit of understanding the gospel. It's not to change God's mind about us, but it's for our benefit so that we can start walking out and enjoying, like I'm sharing here today, your inheritance. You're coming into the know your understanding. So when you understand the truths, then you start walking in them, enjoying them too. Amen. Praise God. So, there is one other inheritance I haven't mentioned yet. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53. It says, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So that's our great hope as Christians, is that we won't always live in these mortal bodies that are subject to decay. You know, this body will return to dust eventually. We will not always live in these bodies, praise God. We will be given new imperishable bodies, which as it says in another verse I'm about to read, are reserved in heaven for you. Your, your, this inheritance, this portion of your inheritance is reserved incorruptible in heaven for you. Amen. And as it says in Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the fact that you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are impenetrable by sin in your spirit. That's what that means in verse 13. You're sealed. You know, I, Andrew Womack uh, has this great little example, which I just, I had to adopt as my own. <laughs> but, you know, you think of when people can vegetables or preserves, jelly. You know, they put on, they put that lid on and seal it with wax or some other means, vacuum pack, pack it, and so that you can put that on the shelf after it's been sealed for years, even years and years, and it never decays, it never gets moldy or grows, gets buggy, you know, I mean, you can pull that strawberry jam off the shelf years later and it tastes as good as when the first day you canned it. So in the same sense, our spirit is sealed, vacuum packed by the Holy Spirit so that we are 
impenetrable by evil or sin. There's no way that sin can touch our spirit. And the fact that you are always holy in your spirit, always sanctified, always righteous, always pure and holy in your spirit, the, the Holy Spirit can live there. He never leaves you because you're always a pure vessel, a pure temple for Him to live in due to that fact. You and Him are one. And it's by Jesus' perfect sacrifice that this is, this is possible. And the fact that He has come to live in you is your guarantee. You know, the fact He's with you and always for you and lives in you is a, the guarantee of your future inheritance that you will receive, which is your incorruptible body. Amen? I mean, that's you got the down payment, you could say, in your spirit already, so you are bound to receive the rest <laughs> any day now. Right? Amen. When Jesus appears, we shall receive our incorruptible bodies again. And then again, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, where is this reserved for you? In 1 Peter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And what is this living hope? That means great expectation. You know, what are we looking forward to? You know, we are, we are not citizens of this world. We live in this world, but we aren't of this world, as many of you know. And so we have a great, greater hope, a greater expectation. So, and what is that? And as it says here in the next verse, verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So you will not lose out. God is watching over your inheritance for you, reserved for you in heaven. Amen. So not only do we receive our inheritance right now, which is Him, but we have a future inheritance that we are about to receive. I don't, you know, of course I can't give a date, but, you know, all the signs are, I'm sure you're aware of, are already manifesting that Jesus can return at any moment. And, and, of course, when he returns, he will be bringing this additional incorruptible inheritance that is reserved in heaven currently for us with him. Amen. So we, it's only going to get better. If you're going through a trying time right now, the good news is it doesn't last forever. It's a short-lived you know, in the, in, the, in the realm of eternity, you know, you're lived for millions and millions and millions of years. So what is a month or two or a year or ten years in the grand scheme of eternity? It's nothing. So it really helps you keep your correct perspective and, and let those little things dwindle down and I mean they may seem big in size because you're living this life now in this earth but in the realm of eternity it's not as anywhere anywhere near the glory that you're about to receive in Christ and actually let me just go there I'm thinking of Romans 8 18 I think I didn't have this pulled up before, so give me a moment to flip there. Romans 8. Speaking of which, we're talking about trials and challenges. It says, For I consider, this is Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. So you may be going, and I'm not meant to, you know, shrug off any challenges you may be experiencing, but this is to help you keep those things in perspective, to know that greater is He that is in you. You know, you are filled with God Himself. So allow those things that may be challenging you outwardly to be brought to the correct perspective in your mind by acknowledging the great glory that you've been given in Christ. As it says here in Scripture that you know, the challenges, the sufferings of this present world can't even compare. It's like, it's like a um, smoldering wick that's blown out with not even much of a breath. You know, those things are not even worthy to be compared to the immense glory and magnificence and extravagant love that can be revealed to you right now in Christ. Amen. That's what we're talking about today is that you would know this inheritance that you have in Christ. And when you know that inheritance, then the things of this world, as the song goes, grow strangely dim in the light of the knowledge of Him. Amen? Praise God. So again, I mentioned that these things are, as it says here in Scripture, reserved in heaven for you, but also, like I started at the very beginning, in Ephesians 1 verse 18, it says, you know, when Paul prayed this prayer for the saints, he said, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you to, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance is in the saints. Amen. So it's not only we have to wait till heaven till we get our inheritance. No, like I've been saying, your inheritance is God. You've already received him. You, you've gotten all of him and you don't have to wait to receive him to some later date. And he's right there with you in your own spirit right now. As it says right there, the glorious inheritance, where is it? In the saints. That's you. You are a saint. You're not a sinner, by the way. <laughs> some, some Christians think they're a sinner saved by grace. No, now that you've trusted in Christ, you're a saint. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and your whole inheritance is already in you in your spirit because remember your inheritance is God and everything else that he possesses and if, if you and him are one like I mentioned earlier well then there's no separation or division between you two in the spirit of course he's not in the soul realm He's aware of how you feel. That's your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your memories, your imaginations, your personality. You know, it's, it's the part of you that you probably commonly refer to as yourself. But in fact, you truly are a spirit. And you possess a soul and you live in a body to help you out. You're a three-part being and you are a spirit. So where God has joined himself to you, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, is the spirit. So you and him are one. You've inherited him and there's no division between you two. So and that being the case, everything that Jesus has is everything that you have. Is Jesus sick? Is he ever um, depressed? Is he ever discouraged? Is the father ever angry at him? Etc. 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 
No. You know, God, Jesus, has an abundance of everything. He is not lacking in any good thing, and neither are you then, therefore. Right? Amen. So that's where your inheritance is. You already got it. <laughs> You know, and, and like I said, you know, you, you look at the verse I just previously mentioned in First Peter where it says it's your inheritance is reserved for you in heaven and you try and reconcile the two and basically just remember that you are seated in heaven, right? I mentioned that too in uh, Ephesians 2 verse 6. It says you are seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ. So you and him are, spiritually speaking, positionally at the Father's right hand in the Spirit. That's how you can manage to even have the authority that you've been given in Christ. Is you are seated above every principality and power, ruler of the dark kingdom in Christ and that's by and how you have authority over all those demonic influences is because you are way 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 above them because because you are in him amen so that's how you can reconcile both of these two scriptures about your inheritance one's reserved in you for you in heaven and one's already in the saints well course your your redeemed bodies of course obviously your incorruptible bodies have not manifested yet so that definitely is a portion that's still reserved for you in heaven that we will shortly be receiving amen so I also wanted to mention as we close up here is how do you continue to walk in the understanding of your inheritance that you've been given in Christ. You know, we want to make sure we stick to the right message. And that's exactly what Paul said here in Acts 20, verse 32. We're talking about how to receive your inheritance. And he said, Now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So it's the grace of God and understanding the grace of God in Jesus Christ that we can receive this inheritance, that we're, by understanding, we are enabled to receive this inheritance that we have in Him. So please continue in the grace of God. Please continue in understanding more and more and more about all the richness of the glory of His inheritance that He's provided you in Christ. Amen? Amen. And we'll never get to the end of it. I mean, you can't... You know, it says grace and peace is multiplied to you through the knowledge of Him and of Jesus Christ. So as we grow more and more by revelation, I'm not talking about how many scriptures you can spout off, but just even half a verse, even one word that becomes revelation to you is, can be multiply peace and grace to, you, to your heart. And you can walk in an abundance of his life through that knowledge, through that revelation. So continue, as Paul said here, to stay in the message of grace, in the gospel of what Jesus has freely provided you because he loves you so much. He wants every good thing for you and he's not at all withholding anything good from you. As it says in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd and I don't have one need, not one want. It's his good pleasure to take good care of his sheep and you are in a sense sheep of his pasture. He's the good shepherd. 
And so he wants you fluffy and well-fed and laying down in green pastures of his rest. Resting in the finished work that he's provided for you on the cross. Amen? So continue to enjoy your inheritance. Enjoy God is basically in a nutshell. Enjoy every good thing that he gives you freely because not only him does of himself has he given you, but every other good thing because he's a good father. Amen. So thank you for joining me today and I'm so glad you joined and I look forward to sharing with you again next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.